Hello, everybody. Welcome to Watchers Within Us. I think I'm a, a few seconds late, but but hopefully, but hopefully not too bad for anyone. Uh, and I hope everyone's having a really good morning for those that are watching the U.S. where it is morning and whatever time of day it is for the rest of you as well. Uh, we've got a couple of topics today that we're going to go ahead and cover. We're going to talk a little, and, and I realize I'm checking my audio because I did not mute the sound on that. Well, I guess that works and so we can close that. All right. Apologies. Uh, so two topics today. We are going to go over the Tudor FXD, uh, the new version, the black dial version. And then we are also going to go ahead and talk a bit about GPHG. That uh, the nominees or the finalists or however, I guess the finalists are, I don't know. Do they do a finalist stage? I guess it's just the nominee stage. Uh, we're going to go over those. Uh, that came out a few weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, but I've kept having other topics <laughs> that have come up. Like I wanted to talk about the, the mo uh, moods. Oh my gosh, the bioceramic watch and all of that. So anyway, uh, just real quick. Good morning, Kevin. Hope things are well for you in Florida. And good morning, Tony. Uh, uh, speaking of Tony, who uh, co-hosts with me for Eclectic Gamers, I am. I finally got my official Eclectic Gamers shirt, my fursona shirt. You can see my little, that's me. Because I'm the crabby one. And Tony is the walrus. Because he's the fun one. But. We're going to have lots of fun today. Uh, now, not a lot of videos this week. I have uh, started a, a new job as of Monday. I started a new job, so I was very, very busy. I did put out a video on the Tudor FXD this morning, though. So I got up early and uh, I was like, you know what? Let's go ahead and throw together a pre-record on that. And so that's what I, I did. So that's now available. We will start talk about it today because some of you on the live chat might have thoughts and I'd like to hear those uh, kind of in real time. I think it's a little more fun interacting that way. Though feel free to watch that video and comment. It's about five minutes long. Um, and so I do have that. And that's the only other video other than this one, which I try and consistently do. And thankfully, new jobs uh, do not do not cause any sort of disruption there. I do see uh, uh, Ken, welcome, and uh, 99 Set Club. I want to know where you can buy the shirt. I will, uh, while I'm talking to you all, I will find my link because uh, I know I have that over at Teespring. I just don't have it ready to go because that is with my pinball and video game podcasting work, not with the uh the usual stuff that we do on this channel but i do have it right here in a folder so while i'm loading that up uh i guess oh standard live stream wristwatch check i am wearing the zenith uh chronomaster original i actually got that out yesterday uh for work and i i think i went through like three watches this week uh and so the um i just figured you know what i'm gonna wear that one because it's small enough to get under the cuff of a shirt i'm probably gonna have to go and buy myself some more dress shirts because i hadn't been wearing them very much for quite a while uh link in the live stream chat to the uh to this to this shirt it does involve a watch so i guess i could have put it in the uh description of the video maybe I'll, maybe i'll do that when we're done but um hello neff so I know the order in the subject line said that we were going to talk about GPHG and then I listed Tudor, but I want to start with Tudor first because I did end up putting out the video. So I, I don't know. I don't want it to be too, like too redundant. Like for those of you that have actually already gone and just caught my, my little pre-recorded first thoughts video. So uh, link in the description to this, a blog to watch article. Uh, there are plenty of other articles. It's Tudor. Everyone covered it. Hodinkee had a piece that I read through. I'm sure the others have. I've only read a couple of them though because this came out about, what, two days ago, I think, at this point. So um, not a lot to say per se in the sense that this is not a new watch. This is a new colorway. Well, with a, with a slight difference. This is a new colorway, by and large, to the Pelagos FXD. Now, it's 42 millimeter grade two titanium watch, so it's all going to be entirely brushed because I'm not going to say it's impossible to polish grade two titanium, but no one does it in watches, at least. And I understand it's very challenging to work with the material in that way. So grade five, which is a blend, it's a more of a, it's an alloy, uh, is what people tend to polish. So let's just see some of the uh, blog to watch up close shots while we talk here. But 42 millimeters, uh, the big change up versus the, this is the, I think, fourth FXD watch in the Pelagos line. The main thing that stands out to me with all of the Pelagos watches is the fully minute graduated, 60 minute graduated bezel. So then these are the same watches. Just It comes with two straps, it comes with a fabric strap and it comes with this mesh rubber uh, looking strap. 
The uh, the change though here is, so the dial on the original is blue with all white text. You can see Pelagos is in red on this and they've gone with white text still. And we now have a matte black dial. I know back in my 20, I think maybe I didn't say with the FXD. I think maybe I did. I know I've said it before, like new colorway for Pelagos was going to happen this year. Obviously uh, it being black is in no way a surprise. You got to get them Submariner vibes out somehow. Uh, I think it's attractive. I actually think it looks better than the blue. Another change, though, subtle change, but but I think worth noting. Aside from the closed case back, I think there's some engraving differences on it versus the blue one. Like, I don't think it references the, the French uh, Navy anymore. Uh, is This is unidirectional, uh, the bezel. Now, I, I've not handled a, uh, an FXD before. I don't know why maybe it was a historic reason maybe one of you in the chat knows i don't know why they ever did bi-directional for a dive watch i always thought that was really weird the traditional pelagos is unidirectional but the fxd and not just the original one but the carbon fiber red bull racing ones they're all bi-directional bezels but they've decided to go unidirectional here so i don't think because i don't swim with it i don't really care that you you know i but as a dive watch i thought part of the whole thing was if you the value for unidirectional was if you bumped it, they, um, it would, it, you'd only bump it in a way that you'd think you had less time. I'm opening my can of diet, Dr. Pepper, um, that you'd think you'd have less time available on your dive. You don't want to bump it in a way where you think you have more time than you would. Cause then you might run out of air or something I think was the idea. So anyway, that was the, that was the, the thought, but I'm sure there's a reason why the FXD went with bi-directional. I just don't know what that reasoning was. Uh, I've always heard great things about these cloth straps from Tudor. Uh, every time I've uh, handled a Tudor, they have not been on the cloth. They've always been on whatever the alternative strap is. It's still got an entire novel down at the six o'clock position, four lines of text. My understanding is this watch has been in trials with the seals, I think. Um, and it uh, it only has two lines of text on the military versions. Hmm. But if I've learned anything about Tudor, it is that they absolutely love to have lots and lots of text on their watches. So anyway, um, I'll go and, and see what you guys in the chat are saying about it, because that's really all I had. I mean, it's it's like the blue FXD, except it's black and the and the bezel is um, unidirectional in terms of how it turns. That's it. That's that's the change up. Same movement, time only. I think all the other spec dimensions on thickness and everything thing to note, and this isn't new, but a thing to note about FX, uh, the FXD is this does not use spring bars. These lugs have a, have a fixed bar. I think there's an angle of a photo that will give you a better sense of it. Maybe it's only the one on Tudor site that I use. Cause I use their, their uh, official photos for my, my video. Cause I haven't handled it. Um, but because these bars are, are part of the lugs themselves, you cannot, there we go. There's the shot. So it's built into the case. So only pass through straps can be used. 22 millimeter straps work on this. So essentially you're pretty much limited to NATO style. Uh, they have that rubber mesh thing, which is a pin bucket. So if you can find a single piece strap that goes in like that, that isn't a NATO, you can use those as well. But obviously a lot of your options like sailcloth, silicon, if you happen to like leather on your dive watches, many of the third party options come with the spring bar configuration for obvious reasons. So those are just not going to work on this style watch. Uh, so that's just something to bear in mind. If you're looking at the FXD, you are being really married to just a few straps because of this case construction, which is pretty unique to the FXD model. This isn't new for this new version, that I thought it was worth noting because you might want to look at a regular Pelagos if, if that's a problem for you. But let's see. What do you all say about it? Uh, Tony says, both look nice. I agree. It looks better than the blue. Neff feels that they screwed up the bezel. It was a countdown bezel supposed to be used for underwater navigation, not timing. Okay. All right. So thank you for the the in instructions about that. Not timing a dive. Uh, right. Right. Obviously. Because, uh, or at least I thought that was obvious. Uh, in the sense that we were talking about dive watch in this particular construction. Okay, so that would make sense. So, uh, so in that regard, maybe the bi the bidirectional isn't the same the same concern because it wasn't wasn't going to be used in the same capacity. All right, well, feel free to comment as we go along, but I'm going to go ahead and jump to GPHG because that's going to be some new stuff. All right, I mean, this was new stuff too, but it's just another FXD. I mean, I don't know. Uh, 
It looks good. Uh, I'm not in the market for it, but hey, now you all know. What you might not know about is GPHG. So this is a big like French word uh, phrase. What is it? Uh, the acronym or initialism, I think more specifically, is for Grand Prix d'Orology de Genève. So that's the entity that does this. And they give out these awards every year in a variety of categories for timepieces. Uh, I note timepieces because they're not even all watches. Uh, you can probably, if you can make out the list, there's there's clocks. Uh, they've got some, I think all the artistic crafts are watches, but but they do have clocks. So it's broken up into a variety of categories. Uh, a lot of timepieces can be nominated uh, and are, are submitted. And then they've published a few weeks ago this, the list of nominated pieces. So you can see there's a variety of of categories, some of which aren't of particular use or uh, use use or interest to me. Like I don't really shop ladies watches so because I don't wear ladies watches. So those aren't of particular interest to myself. But I thought it'd be fun to kind of go through these and see sort of which ones stand out to those of us who are watching. And those of you who are not watching live but are watching the recording, if you see one that you think is really interesting, love to hear about it. Just leave a comment below. Go ahead. I didn't note this in my usual promotional plugs at the beginning. I'm not putting them in the chat, uh, but there's links to the Discord. There's an invite if you want to participate in the Discord where we talk about watches. Uh, that can be a lot of fun. So the link is in the video description. Also, if you want to join the 99 Cent Club like Ken has, you can do that through the link in the video description. They're all clearly demarcated. So let's jump down to the men's category here of nominated watches. We got six here, uh, two of which caught my eye. One is this uh the debathoon uh the db 28 xs starry seas is what it's called and the other is the parmigiani fleurier tonda pf micro rotor uh i think parmigiani has a stronger category uh, uh watch in the next category on complication i'll go ahead and load those two up so those are the two that kind of caught my eye though uh obviously ap's got their star wheel watch that got a lot of attention earlier this year from a lot of collectors who felt this is the first maybe not the first but it's the first one i've heard many of them admit was in their paraphrasing their words a good looking code 1159 watch uh so if you're interested we can look more into that one uh recep recepi uh or zavdet recepi uh i guess in this case i'm not familiar with this i didn't really I don't really actually, I'm not going to click on that unless someone really wants me to, because I don't think it looks good, but okay. So this is the Debathune Starry Seas. Now, Debathune, you know, I feel like I hear about Debathune a lot, probably because I like to watch Tim Masso's feed and Watchbox, uh, which is a secondhand watch dealer, owns a sizable stake in Debathune. So it feels like they're kind of put shilling it a little bit, no, maybe not even a little bit. I don't know. It's not a majority of their content, but they talk about Debathune more than they would have, I think, without having the investment. Mm. My problem is when I hear about Debathune, this is what I think of is what they've got here on the back. A lot of their dials look like Star Trek emblems, and I actually do not like that. I think it looks way too derivative, like they're trying to steal from Star Trek. I don't think that's their goal. I don't think that is why they have the Star Trek emblem of the Federation, but that's what it looks like. But here, at least, it's on the back of the watch. Now, the dial itself, I think, is what was is more interesting and what's more attractive. So, obviously, it's called the Starry Seas for a reason, but this isn't one of those traditional, uh, what is it, adventuring style dials. So, it's, you know, it, it sees like, again, I think it's a good descriptor. Like, it, it's got these gleams. To me, they remind me of water bubbles because I see the texturing here. Uh, which I think looks a lot like waves and not so much like I, I could see why you could say it looks like stars, stars in the sea, but I think it looks more like bubbles. But, but I, I originally really, really like it, uh, like that look. Uh, this is actually a titanium watch as well. So I think that's pretty noteworthy. I like the the use of the chapter ring here, the numeral choices, the handsets, uh, different, but, but attractive, I think. Um, so all of that. Uh, and I, I think the whole, like the dial is done in titanium. Like, I think this is all pretty much titanium. I think a number of the movement components are as well. Silicone, silicone escapement, but let's see what the write-up here says. Uh, and I'll scroll back up because most of you want to see the, the photo. So it's 39 millimeter watch. Um, yeah, I think what they did is they heated the, uh, the titanium to get it to the blue, kind of like how we heat treat, uh, other metals. So yes, it is titanium dial. 
They've got, that's about all that I think is really noteworthy. Again, these aren't overly complicated watches. It's just they've done a lot in the material. Because most of the time with titanium, you think just the, the case work. But anyway, it was one of those that uh, that I thought was pretty attractive. Uh, but I, you know, oh, I was going to say, I have no idea what the price is other than it's Debethune, so it's a lot. Yeah, here we go. So 83,000 Swiss francs. So yeah, I, I'm not quite sure what the, the conversion is loosely one-to-one, -one, but it's more in dollars. Uh, but I think it'd be under 100,000, but obviously it's a very significant price point watch. Um. Okay, let us see here. DeRosa says, uh, Watchbox is trying to make Debathun a thing. <laughs> yes, yes. It feels like kind of like how uh, when they seem to scoop up all the FP Jorns and I don't know if they were trying to corner the market on FP Jorn. This was a few years ago. They're probably stuck with a lot of them. That's extra. That one's extra amusing to me because Tim Masso actually uh, likes Debathun. You can tell how he did, talks about him. He does not like FP Jorn. I mean, you can all, he doesn't hide it. So it's interesting because he works for Watchbox uh, just in terms of the content creation. So yes, the, the, de the Delta. Uh, yeah, it's, um, and this is on a lot of their watches. This, this is on the back on a lot of instances. It's on the front. Uh, they do have a really, this is not unique to this watch, but one of the cool things about the watch design is these flex, these lugs, you can see the hinging here. I think you can see my mouse. So they've got the hinging here. So when you tighten the strap, it bends and these lugs will hug the wrist. So it's actually very accommodating to a variety of wrist sizes. It's obviously 39 millimeter. Uh, in most instances, it's going to fit most uh, most uh, men's watches, or uh, wrist sizes, for example. That's generally not too big for, for people. For those, though, that that Maybe it's still too small, possibly. But you see, it has a very, it's got quite a look when it's all the way flared out like this and not flexing at all. That's how it would look on a larger wrist. So I just think that's sort of interesting. Uh, Neff uh, says, great watchmaking, horrendous looking watches. Um, yeah, most of them, they have some other dressy style watches, but that doesn't seem to be what they promote. Their dressy ones, I, I think, look nice. It's like, it's not a brand I've seriously considered, but again, they're so expensive. <laughs> Why would I? Um, one of those things. Now, Koji is weighing in uh, with a, something not related at all to Debathun, but uh, bringing up the AP, the Anima Piguet. Uh, original Star Wheel from the 90s is pretty awesome piece. Design-wise, I prefer it without the running seconds that they have on the code 1159. We'll go ahead and take a look at that. Let me just go ahead and throw uh, the Tonda here real quick because I had it loaded up. Uh, I really like what Parma, I like a lot of what Parmigiani Fleurier does. It's not a brand I was overly familiar with until, oh, probably the last 10 months or so. I started, actually, I'll say more like a year. It was really after their GMT version came out with the hidden hour hand. And they're not the only ones who do that. Patek Philippe has done that for a while on GMT watches, but uh, they do a lot of simple two handers. They actually have a lot more complicated looking watches as well. The biggest thing that I think has just helped them, and it's such a lame thing to point out, is they've simplified their logo. Uh, you can find these still trade. I, you can get them used, I believe, less than new, at least the these unsophisticated time only ones. But uh, if you look at the ones that have Parmigiani Fleurier all the way on the dial, they go for quite a bit less than they retail that. So, but but both of but even just saying the logo aside, they have their own design style, which is nice. It's a newer brand. So it, it's nice to see. But anyway, this is just their, this is their basic uh, time plus state watch that came out. This is in platinum. Uh, so it's not steel. So if it looks a little like a little less shiny, that is why uh, it is a different metal. Uh, love their, let's zoom in a bit if I can. Yes, I can. All right. I, I like their, their movement finishing, their micro rotor work. It's all really, really attractive. Like they've got great uh, Geneva striping on the bridges. This is really, really attractive. Um, sort of watch. So anyway, this is 85,000. So this is actually more than the Debethune we looked at. It's 85,000. It's like a thousand more Swiss francs. Uh, but again, it's uh, it's platinum, so not too surprising. But as uh, as Koji mentioned uh, about the star wheel. So here we go. Uh, this is what that, this is what the current version, not the one from the nineties looks like, because this does have the running seconds. It all just does this rotation thing. And like as a, I don't like the way it looks personally. I don't like the look of the star. It's too, it's too avant-garde for me. It's a cool idea. 
Uh, so some people are really going to like this just because it's such a unique way to tell the time. But like if I was leaning into a watch that did something weird like this, I would probably I would be more interested in like what resonance does than this personally. But with the like adventuring backdrop and all of that, it very much lives up to its name of the star wheel. So it's 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 nice. I definitely see why people looked at this and go, thank you, AP, for not making every code 1159 look like a fashion watch. But, you know. Anyway, it's much cheaper than the other two we've looked at, 52,000 Swiss francs. So, uh, yeah, it's fun. Hours, minutes, center seconds. That's what it does. But um, not for me. So, I don't know. I almost think I should have done polling. I Unfortunately, they've got like six options, and I don't want to type that much. And YouTube polling won't let me do more than five choices. But it'd be interesting to, to – well, feel free in the chat, actually, those of you who are watching live. Uh, I guess if you want to in the comments, you can as well. But, like, which of these six do you think wins this? Because they win by category. So this is the men's category, not men's complication. And these are the six. So you've got the Star Wheel, uh, Debethune Starry Seas, uh, and the Parmigiani Tonda PF Micro Rotor. But then there are the three others we didn't look at from brands that I'm not super familiar with. Uh, Zadet Rajepi, it's a Minute Inarti. Uh, we got Simone Breit. I saying all these wrong. I'm sure the Conometra Artisan and uh, Ferdinand Berthon. Oh, I have heard of Ferdinand uh, Chronomet uh, FB. So I don't know. They're all too skeletonized for me. That's why I don't like any of those. But catching up on the chat, Neff says that FB looks much looks like a much better watch than the Debethune. Okay. For me, it's too skeletonized, but it does have some interesting uh, design language. The chapter ring is actually minutes, like you would expect, so there's that. DeRosa, welcome to live stream, says, uh, Parmigiani is building their own design language. I really like their clean style. Yes, see, we are we are of a, of a similar mind here with Parmigiani. Uh, Koji also agrees. Oh, we got a whole bunch of Parmigiani fans in the house today. Uh, Neff says, the old 36 millimeter star wheel is probably my favorite Audemars Piguet. This watch doesn't know what it wants to be. Is it a sports watch or is it a dress watch? Way too big for dress, no specs for sport. As as usual, Neff, you're you're quite fair with your judgment. So unfortunately, I guess the Star Wheel won't win. Um, Tony says he actually likes the Simone. Okay. Again, too skeletonized for me. We'll load up some close-ups though. We'll have some fun here. And I see Koji has also sort of a mirrored Neff's statement about what's going on with the star wheel. So just real quick, here's the FB. If you want to take a look at it. Um, I do like the, uh, you know, that media blast. Uh, there's a frosted. That's the tech. I think that's the technical term they like to use in the watch field. Is, this is a frosted dial. Oh, what little is not skeletonized. I mean, for a skeletonization, this actually looks super clean because uh, the hours and minutes are still fully occupied. Like my biggest problem with a lot of dials, this is not just skeletonized dials. This is a, let's have a Dennis whiny mule moment. Whiny mule moment, like uh, the Bel Canto from Christopher Ward or a whole bunch of the Breguets where all the time telling is up here. And like that's it. The rest of it is just like guilloche or, or skeletonized or, hey, look at this kind of bird looking uh, chime unit. It's like, I, I like most of the dial to tell the time. So this does do that, and it just has put things like the uh, the escape wheel, um, the palette, and the balance. So this is actually one of the cleanest skeletonizations I've ever seen. So I, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna I still wouldn't buy this, but this actually I'm gonna put this up above some of the Cartier. I I don't want to call it skeletonized because it's not fully skeletonized, but this is a very attractively done configuration that actually lets you see the movement through the through the dial. Other than Cartier, I hate almost all attempts at skeletonization i like zenith and their incessant open heart open hearts in particular absolutely uh irritate me to no end but um and here's the simone so now this is interesting so this is far more this is almost like uh little chips of it reminds me of like a little mirrored shards like a disco ball because it seems haphazard in how they're laid out but very finely done. I don't like this as much uh, as the FB, personally. Um, again, very, very clean configuration. I don't really like being able to see what the yoke here. Uh, I think that I don't think that's a particularly attractive piece to show off. I do like how they've integrated the gear train or the going train uh, here, but 
Let's see what the back looks like. The back's probably great. Yeah, back's awesome, but that doesn't surprise me. Um, I'm all for it on the back of the watches, just the front where I where I I tend to struggle. So I prefer the FB to the to the Simone. But sorry, my Zoom's effect because we're on the GPHG site. So, uh, no one cares about this, but in Chrome, if you hold down Control and you mo- use your mouth wheel to zoom in and out it remembers it for the website. So if I have different websites up, I can zoom on one and it won't affect the other pages. But since we're at gphg.org for all this, incidentally, that is in the video description if you want to be able to go and access all these. It should link right to the nominated timepieces if I did the link right. Um, It affects all the pages that I open up. Of these six, I think the star wheel wins this. I think that's what's actually going to win GPHG. That's definitely the one that got the most attention with the watch media. And uh, I know it's a, it's essentially a throwback, but I, I just think that's the one that's going to end up winning out in the in this one. I think it's the one that's going to be seen as the most interesting. I don't know what ultimately, like, I don't know what the GPHG panel really uses to make their judgments, but that's sort of the direction that, that I think, um, that I think it would be. So uh, violinist or violinist William, welcome to the live stream, uh, says this watch is stunning. Unfortunately, I've seen fashion watches that could pose as this. That's my issue with skeletonized. Yeah. Skeletonization has become very common. And a lot of times my biggest problem with it is it becomes hard to read the time. And again, I think the FB does a better job. You can see like with the blued hands stands out a bit, but I think it stands out better. Here with a Simone, I think it just gets too blended uh, myself. I just think it's hard to read. Maybe if they hadn't done this huge open worked uh, like jumbo Mercedes style hour hand. I don't know. But that's just my take. Uh, Neff says FB to some of the best finishing in the industry. And he really likes the Simone. Is it Simone or Simon? I th- it sounds fancier if I say Simone. That's why I'm doing it. Uh, really odd observatory hand. Oh, is that what it's called? The observatory hand. Okay. Yeah, I... I hate that hand personally, but hey, that's that's part of the fun. We all have different tastes. So let's jump to the men's complication watches now. OK, so we got RDA, which I'd never heard of before I started looking at this list, which has their tiny purity tourbillon chameleon watch. That's interesting to me because there's a tourbillon section that also has nominees. I don't think it's in that one, but um, but it might be. I think you can be in multiple categories, so it may very well be. I didn't look that closely at tourbillons because you want to talk about complications I don't care about. <laughs> there's, a, there's another one. Uh, Audemars Piguet has got the Royal Oak Concept Split Second Chronograph GMT large date version kind of hard to see but it is up there at the 12 uh bovet and they're 1822 um I, a lot of these moon phases like this parmigiani does a style like this um but not here here uh parmigiani's uh tonda pf uh minute Ratraponte that they came out with that quasi stole the show this year i won't say it, di- it did because i think to a lot of people, the Ratraponte felt too much like, oh, yeah, it's the GMT watch. They just slightly modified the complication. And I think you would be right to say that. But um, but it, it got some attention. Uh, Piaget's Polo Perpetual Calendar. I actually heard a number of uh, watch blogger types on their podcast praise the Polo. They really like the look of it. And then, uh, v- I don't know this brand. V- Volt- Voltil- Voltilian? Voltilian? Anyway, they have some sort of world timer with more of those obnoxious hands. Um, I I think this is between two watches. I think this is uh, like, I think GPHG picks the Parmigiani. I think it's between that and the Piaget though. So again, I think there's another, yeah. Oh, it's available in steel and platinum. I was going to say, I thought this was another platinum watch, but they do have it in steel. Again, same uh, awesome Parmigiani finishing micro rotor approach that they're really leaning into lately for their, this is the whole Tonda is their integrated sports watch. Uh, and I think it's got, it's very much its own design language, which uh, I really like. So uh, it, that's probably why I keep looking at their Tondas more and more. They actually have a variety. Like they have Tondas that are more dress watch as well. That aren't the integrated style. It just sort of depends which, which category we're talking about. These micro rotors though, are all the, this format. So anyway, it's, um, it got a lot of attention uh, in, when it came out, or the GMT did in 2022. This did get some pretty positive, if it felt a little derivative, uh, buzz when it when it dropped this year. But nice, clean aesthetic. I think this gets more attention because of the complication 
than their time only one we talked about earlier. So I think this one will fare very well and is the one I, I mentioned I think it ends up winning. Uh, but that said, the Perpetual Calendar from Piaget, a lot of people like uh, like Piaget as a brand. It's In my head, it's more known for thin watches, and this is one of their ultra thin, so that, that makes sense. But obviously, the degree of complication involved. I'm not quite sure how thick this is. I wanted to look. Okay, it's under nine millimeters for a perpetual chronograph. That is, that is really thin. I'm trying to think what my thinnest watch I've ever had was. Mechanically, it might be the Tudor 1926 which I think was a little, it was between nine and 10, if I recall, but that was just the time plus date. This with a full perpetual calendar feature, very cleanly done. Gr All right. Green is a year or two late to have, but, but Hey, it's four screen and it's sort of a sunbursty style. So that's going to, I think it's going to appeal. Hmm. 72,500 Swiss franc ranch is a dress watch is only 30 meters of water resistance, but, uh, and it's in gold case. So, that would all make sense. But anyway, I think those are the two strongest there. Um, in terms of what you all think, I want to take a look. Uh, let's see. Tony thinks the RDA is gross. Um, that's probably because it's slime puke green. A little Getting a little bit like if if anemic, if Slimer from Ghostbusters had anemia, this was would be what he looks like. That would be my description of that case style. But I'm sure that's, I mean... What did they do? It's like a, I'm guessing it's a sapphire case that they just tinted in some capacity, but I'm not a uh, nano sapphire uh, changing color case. What? what does that mean? Why is there an orange one? RTA a sapphire alchemist has succeeded in developing nano sapphire. I'm sure it's said just like that. What is nano sapphire? A technology that colors the polycrystalline material. Oh, okay. The chameleon case reflects a first color, amber orange in natural light. And when while exposed to artificial light, it instantly changes to green. Okay. It's ugly, but it's uh, that but that is cool. Uh, so you, I didn't know that. I this is what I get for clicking on it and learn I learn more. Okay, so in the sunlight, it's orange. And then in my normal working environment, it becomes anemic slimer, which is fascinating. But, but I, I don't, I don't know how well it does. What's the price on it? It's gotta be a lot, right? Oh my gosh. I thought it was going to be like maybe 50% uh, less than this. All right. It's 155,000 Swiss francs. Um, oh, it's a one piece limited series. Okay. It's a one piece. It's a one off watch. I don't know if that gets enough attention or not. I don't know how these awards work. So I'm sure I listened to how someone explained how they worked once and I've long since forgotten because I'm not a voter. So I did. I just don't care too much. Uh, Neff says, I love the Beauvais. I've always been a fan. Uh, nice to see one that's not a pennant watch, and we'll load that one up. I, I like this. I'm growing more and more enamored in this sort of what moon phase complication that they do there. Let's take a quick look at it. Okay, so this is a world timer, right? I mean, yeah, we got we got cities, we got the time. The problem for me is the time telling. Well, oh, is this a this is where I wish I had read about all of these ahead of time, but I ain't got no time for that. Uh, 92,000 Swiss francs. Let's see. Hours, minutes, seconds, moon phase, power reserve, day, night, triple time zone. Okay, that's probably for the secondary time zone. Yeah, yeah, because this is set for 10, 10, and this is at 11, 11, well, I guess not quite to 10, but whatever. All right, interesting. All right, so they still have the primary time taking up most of the dial, which is what I like. For me, world timers are really hard to get to be attractive. I'm not a huge fan of being able to see all the cities and stuff in the in the display uh, at once, but it's hard to accommodate otherwise unless you're doing a lot of disc windows. So uh, I do like these, uh, these moon face styles. Parmigiani, as I mentioned, had something like that. We're going to see some more of these later on in the list, but but very interesting. Um uh, let's see. Nefanow is hedging. It says, well, maybe love is a strong word. I prefer it. Okay. That's, that's fair. That's fair. Koji says, Kari Voltulien, which I'm sure I'm totally butchering. One of the best bespoke makers in the world, in my opinion. Okay. I'll have to read up on them. I'm not from the, I, this is a first for me. I've like, I'd never heard of them until I, I clicked on this. Uh, Neff also knows about them as one of the most respected watch and dial makers in the world. So now I feel extra stupid that I don't know. But part of my channel is a journey to my own understanding. Uh, the one he did with Zenith recently on the 135 is amazing. I'll have to look it up. I don't, I don't remember it. I must not have read about it. 
Koji says he prefers the Parmigiani as well. Having the platinum bezel is a cool touch. Uh, DeRosa is also siding with Parmigiani out of these six. So yeah, feel free to share which of these six you like the most. Uh, violinist uh, Williams says, I love the Piaget. It just... It, it just says at the dinner party, I know watches and I have taste. I've seen 30 to 40 year old P Piaget polos that have held up beautifully. I, I like the architecture of the polo quite a bit. I've, I've never found one that clicked enough with me to seriously like to look to see if I could find one used that I would, you know, that was in like a price range I could get that I wanted enough to spend the money for. Um, uh, I've been more interested though in, the problem when I search Piaget, and you can do filters and stuff, which obviously means to make sense. A lot of the Piaget line has been historically targeted to women and their smaller watches, but the Polo line is like their one big, I think their one big standout with a lot of collectors. I just think Octofinissimo Octo is getting a lot more attention in the thin watch game lately versus Piaget, but the design language uh, that Bulgari does with that just doesn't click with me as well as Piaget. I think Piaget has a much better laid out dial, uh, a little more classic and less modern would maybe be the way I would describe it. But I do have fairly conservative tastes as we all know from my harsh judgment of those, <laughs> of those earlier dials that were just a little too uh, out there, like the star wheel for me. Um, Neff says it's the one watch that makes Debethune look good. And uh, what a gate complication! What a great complication the Beauvais has. Did we look at the Beauvais? We did. It does. I think they've integrated. I don't care for the discs, but like from a distance and like looking at it here, it'd be kind of like looking at it on my wrist. You know, I think it integrates really well. Plus, it's a really cool way to use like the baby blue, blue color scheme against the grays and silvers. Uh, so overall, I think it's it's attractive for for everything that it's doing. It's more complicated of a watch than I'd, I'd probably get, but I'm not really. I've never really looked at like perpetual calendars and those with all these level functions. Um, DeRosa says an iPhone does, be does multiple time zones much better. <laughs> well, well, you know, uh, we, we all try. I don't know. Outside of really just sort of basic GMT structures. I'm not, I'm not really into like Parmigiani incidentally has a, has like a dual time zone thing where they do like above and below, like at the 12 o'clock and six o'clock, I think they do the two different time zones or something. It doesn't quite, it's an attractive watch, but like, functionally it just doesn't quite make me want to buy it i guess if that makes sense i looked at a lot of par parmigiani's when i before i ended up pulling the trigger on the moser i got so uh, parmigiani's been on the brain lately neff says yeah but an iphone doesn't compare to the pascal raffi and isn't made in a castle well castles are maybe they could start making a castle okay so out of a lot of you uh no one talked about the ap so we ain't loading it up um we'll take a look at this real quick uh, because a few of you really spoke highly of this watchmaker. So this is their world timer. Now, this kind of reminds me of how Omega does world timers. I know not a, not a nice comparison because Omega is a much more affordable watch. In the sense, though, Omega does it in a way I really like where they put everything. We got to look at all of it. If you put it towards the outside of the dial, it appeals to my sense of proportion. So I like that. I don't like the handset. I never have liked this handset style, these giant, I don't know what to call these hollowed out Mercedes style hands. Someone I think else knew the name of them earlier. Um, if I'm looking back in the chat. I, I can't remember what, uh, what it was. Maybe someone can drop it again. If they, is it? No, nope. it was something else. I saw that made me think it was a handset style. I saw it was Tony's reference to Delta. But I think he was thinking of the Debethune and the Star Trek stuff, not Delta hands, uh, which Delta hands are fine. Uh, so, okay, this is actually a steel watch, just under 200,006 Swiss francs. Uh, let's see. Let's take a look at the movement. Because that's where a lot of this praise on watchmaking is going to come in at. Yeah, very nice. Was this hand wine only? It's, yeah, it must be hand wine only. Which, I, I mean, I like for dress watches, personally, because it keeps the size down. Thickness is 12 millimeters, but it is a world timer. So, um, so impressive. I, you know, these these uh, sort of squarish shapes, I, I do like. I don't love them, but I do like them. Like them uh, better than, like, the Monaco is too extreme for me. Uh, but I like the Santos, too. So that's sort of the sort of the style there. Yes, big, big balance wheel. We like, to, we like to watch them swing back and forth. That's why. Okay, next up. Sorry, I hope the clap didn't blow up the mic. Uh, iconic watches. Okay, so another six. <sighs> 
My answer here is real easy, but we have AP's Royal Oak Offshore Self-Winding Chrono, the Breitling B01 Chronograph 41, the Chopard LUC 1860, the Igenur from IWC, the Tag Heuer Carrera Chronograph, and the Freak 1 from Ulysse Nardon. So this is no contest for me. The 1860 is the best looking watch by far out of this entire set. I wish I had one. I love the LUC 1860. It would I would totally break my rule on I'm not buying more dress watches because I have two and two is plenty uh, for an LUC 1860. Totally break that rule. That watch is pure class. It was my favorite watch out of Watches and Wonders. 2023 easily after our spending more time and stewing on everything else that came out. Absolutely. My favorite, no question, beautiful watch. So for me, if that doesn't win the GPHG judging committee is completely wrong. It is by far, it just deserves to win off of looks alone. Let's not forget this. I mean, it, this is show parts LUC line. It's going to be Geneva hallmarked. It's gonna, it, this is not platinum. This is lucent steel. It's their own special blend of steel that they do. Uh, micro rotor. We were, uh, you know, I was praising Parmigiani's micro rotors earlier and they are great, but you know what? Show part is no slouch. Uh, you can see that there with uh, just the intricate work. There's the Geneva seal. If you're curious what that is, meets that particular standard. Absolutely beautiful watch in steel. Uh, they just don't make very many of them uh, per year. It's about 23,000 Swiss francs or about 25,000 US dollars. And it's thin. It's just barely over eight millimeters. So if you want a thin dress watch, and if you want a dress watch, you should. Uh, it's that. It's just a little over 36 millimeters in size. Very traditional sizing. Maybe too small for some people. That'd probably be the biggest complaint I would imagine someone would have. But this watch, I love this watch. This watch is the only one I want to talk about. But that wouldn't be fair, would it? <sighs> the Igenur. A lot of people like this Igenur. Um aesthetically the only thing i've ever honestly heard people complain about is the price to be fair so what is the like a swiss franc is twelve thousand swiss francs no when this dropped a lot of that is the biggest reaction is that this should have been half the price that it was uh significant departure from the last engineer looks but still got a lot of the dna obviously you've got the genta dna in it still so there's that uh, i actually like how this looks i don't love it but it does feel distinct first like no one's going to mix this up with a nautilus or a royal oak or uh or a um what Gerard Perigo Laureato or any of the right like it's got its own look. So I do respect it for that. Uh you know, kind of modern dial texturing going on here along with the uh the Igener font that they use there at the bottom. Um but I don't know. This might win. I don't want it to because I want the 1860 to win, because the 1860 is the best looking watch in this entire list. But that's the other one that I think would probably have a strong a strong shot. Um, in terms of just saying, you know, again, iconic. I mean, the Freak one is an iconic watch. So UN could win as well. That'll be the number three pick. The Freaks aren't something that I've, I've ever seriously considered getting. I think they're cool. Like, as, from a mechanical standpoint, they're very cool. Uh, you know, I like UN as a brand. I've looked at some UN watches, uh, just not this this type. But the way it when it when it's in mo motion, um, I'm hoping that there I can mute it. So I don't want to I don't want I don't want you have to hear it. Uh, but so this kind of hopefully lets you get a little look about how it's if you've never seen one in terms of how it works. So it just goes around and points like that. So that's the that's the approach of the freak one. So very very cool. Uh, mechanically in terms of how it functions. But um, so that's, it's, it's going to be one of those three. I can't imagine that AP winning uh, the Navitimer B01 is an excellent looking watch, but this isn't the first one of those. And same with the Carrera chronograph. I just think they're too derivative of, of what, what's already come before them. So, so those are my takes, but, um, but I don't, but again, it, Totally depends on what I, these all have their own very distinct aesthetic design. So I could totally understand someone going the Royal Oak offshore is iconic and deserves to win this for its configuration or someone siding with the bright light. I could see where anyone would argue for any of these. Uh, I have very strong opinions because I feel very strongly that the show part is the best looking one. But anyway, let's see what you all have to say who are in the live stream. Uh, so in the chat, Neff says 1860 every day. Uh, man of my own heart. Koji Chopard, hands down for me. 
DeRosa, Shepard, Tony, Shepard, Ken, bucking the trend, going all in on the Anima Piguet offshore. Well, it is an icon, so I will say that. Of course, these all are, to be fair. So here's a quick look, uh, because I didn't load it up early earlier for you all to, to get a taste of it. But, I mean, you got the you got the, the tachometer. You've got, you know, chronograph functions, very iconic offshore case. You know, the offshore is a significant departure from the Genta design. I believe Gerald Genta wasn't a fan of the offshore's look, but it's got its own design language because of that. Well, still, you can see where its inspiration comes from. Uh, I don't want to say homage in the nice sense an homage but but you know they went and did a lot of their own own things there uh i actually kind of like their approach with the date here using that uh little little cyclops bubble it looks like more well thought out than in so many other ones well, like with rolex where it just starts you know it's just sort of glued on but um yeah i mean it's a clean look this design doesn't uh doesn't appeal to me as much as the traditional royal oak so uh but it, it's still nice it's just it's no show part 1860. I mean, that's what, that's what it comes down to. It's just no show part 1860. Um, so let's see what other ones. Koji says, can't have too many dress watches, my friend. Well, you know, but maybe I could, maybe I could. Uh, Neff says, uh, love the IWC. Just the price is absurd. The IWC, uh, a very not like I would prefer the IWC engineer to the AP aesthetically. Like I just like that, but I'm not into a lot of the, the funky, like for chronographs, I'm more boring. I'm more bright lean and tag. Like I like this chronograph, uh, look, I prefer the bright lean overall. I like the, I like the B zero B zero one chronograph. I, um, it's just, if I was going bright lean, I'd go Navi timer. So I'm biased towards this because it's a Navi timer. Dorosa says, IWC missed the opportunity to actually make a higher end model, but just dropped an existing movement in and charged a crazy price. And yes, that's where a lot of, for those that weren't uh, following back then on the Igenur when it was revealed, a lot of the grousing was that it didn't, if they had put in a new movement with it, they could have, to a lot of collectors, justified the price tag, but they, they chose not to. And so that was that was tough for folks. Um, Koji's asking if it was the same movement as the Mark 20, and DeRosa does confirm that. Um, and uh, noted that it maybe should have had a display case back. Uh, but hey, that would have required uh, you know, putting some effort. Well, unless they wanted to tutor it up and just put in no effort whatsoever into making that movement look good. Uh, Neff says, I do like the smaller squares on the dial. I can't remember what they're called on the AP. I, the, the waffle, I was just called, I always heard this, this is the waffle style pattern, but, um, I don't know if there's like a technical term or not. Okay. Well, most of you are in alignment with me, uh, about the 1816. We got one AP fan as, and some love for the aesthetics of the Igenur and the other three Breitling tag and Ulysse. No one seems to uh, think that they're going to win. All right, I mentioned that there's tourbillon category, and as I noted before, I didn't think it was in there, and it's not. The RDA chameleon uh, tourbillon is not nominated in the tourbillon list. So, longtime viewers are probably aware, but I'll just reiterate it because you know why would I ever assume that you all are longtime viewers? Anyone can turn turn in at any time that they want. Um, I have never had an interest in tourbillons in wristwatches. I think it's a superfluous complication. Uh, I get it. I get it that it's a flex. I don't care about that. Like, I don't care about the flex on. Like, if, if you want to impress, and again, it's my dress watch bias. You want to flex with me? You do a minute repeater. You don't do a tourbillon. But whatever, it's a category. And minute repeaters aren't a category. So, six tourbillon nominations: Arnold and Son, ultra thin tourbillon gold. I've liked a lot of what Arnold and Son has done. Um, very uh, as a brand. This, I don't know. It's like the cleanest one. It's not my favorite. Um, this one's actually second on my list. Uh, there's the Beauvais 1822. There's the Bulgari Octoroma striking Pap uh, Papillon Turbion, HYT's conical Turbion Infinity Sapphires. That's the most creative one. Uh, Laurent, Laurent Ferrier's Grand Sport Turbion Pursuit is my favorite of these six. And uh, Parmigiani Fleurier's uh, Flying Turbion, which I don't like where they placed it. Normally, I'm actually like I'm I'm the guy who's like I'm wearing my Chronomaster original today. I'm totally cool with like putting 430 date windows and stuff in. I don't know. It just seemed like they were like we can't put it at the six, right? Beauvais and Arnold and Son are putting their tourbillons at the six. Let's put ours at the seven. And it's like, how about now? To quote uh, Doctor Evil, how about now, Parmigiani? Love your dial, but no, absolutely not in this case. You can't. Um, what do I think wins here? 
Uh, my guess would be uh, HYTs. I, I think this is where just like the creative use, we're going to load that up. I think HYT wins. Uh, I'd say my second guess would be Arnold and son. And my favorite would be my third place one for, in terms of what I think wins. And that would be the, the, the Laurent uh, Ferrier. Laurent Ferrier is a, is a brand I've been learning more and more about. Uh, I like a lot of the design choices that they do. Um, it's interesting though, cause it's got to probably, I guess, come down to volume and, and finishing because when I look at the dials and then I see the price tags, Without, if you didn't know about its independent status, I think you're, I think even watch collectors get sticker shock seeing the prices on those. But I don't know. It's actually more approachable as a brand price point wise than, say, Debethune uh, in many instances. But anyway, here's the HYT. So, uh, you know, they got these little sapphires. It's like little planets going around. I mean, it's, it's pretty, my, maybe, maybe they call it Infinity. So you'd be re reminded of the Affinity Gauntlet from the Marvel movies. Um, I like the, you know, the hours here at the edge, you got the pointer that goes around. It's, it, it's different, uh, skeletonized, but I think, I mean, so much of the dial doesn't look like the skeleton to me really that eh, I, it's not my favorite at all, but, but Hey, if you've got 390,000 Swiss francs and you want something co cool and weird, that's using the tourbillon in a fun way. I think this is the only option out of the six they've showed you, uh, Arnold and son, um, you know, Again, this is this was what I meant earlier when I talked about how I didn't like Breguet does this where, oh, here, here's your time telling. It's taking up a fourth of the dial and the rest of the dial is something else. In this case, nothingness other than having the turbine, uh, which does give you something to look at. But uh, so it's super clean. I mean, it's Arnold and Son. It's, it's a great looking watch, but I would even if it wasn't 70,000 Swiss francs, I would never like I would never want it. But. Um, it's also uh, thin. It's this is 8.3 millimeters thick. This has got to be huge to accommodate all that stuff. Was it 25 millimeters? Okay, so this is unwearable, but that, but hey, it's it's cool. So that's why I think it's going to win. Uh, this is actually quite wearable if it's the design that you like. Um, I just to me, it's I, absolutely not. And this is the, my favorite, but maybe because you have a dial that's not showing off the tourbillon. Could that possibly be why? So this is uh, 13 and a half millimeters, uh, 190,000 Swiss francs approximately. And I think it's inspired by some something or other. I don't know what it's based. I don't know what it's based on. Look, look at all this text. They like they wrote they I was going to it's going to be mean and say they spent more time writing this narrative than they did on the watch. But no, I, I, I do like this watch a lot. But if you want to see it, I mean, there's the turbion. You can see it in the back of the watch. But that's one of those things that uh, there have been others that have done this before where it's like, you know what? Front of the dial, you don't need to see it. You don't need to see it. So I, I respect that. Uh, granted, they wrote Turbion on the dial. So then I guess if, if you're in the know and you go, hey, I see a small section. Whoa, it's this Turbion. Where's the Turbion? And you'll be like, yoink. And you flip it over. Um, interesting finishing choice. Uh, here with this brushing the bridge is very unusual for a lot of brands to do. It kind of reminds me of what Yema does when they announced their micro rotor. Uh, I'm, better, I'm, theirs is more media blasted or beat blasted, but um, not my favorite approach. I'm again, I'm a bit more of a traditionalist, but whatever. Anyway, but I like the dial probably because it doesn't show the turbine. Actually, I'm sure that's exactly why it's my favorite, but I don't see it winning. Um, so anyway, those those are my thoughts on the Turbions. Uh, but let me go ahead and catch back up on chat. Tony says, you did say you go to the office now, so you have to dress up more often. Okay. So yeah, with the my new job, I don't work from home anymore. So yeah, and yes, I, I do wear and dress. It's business casual most days is the technical term. I Generally, that means wearing a long sleeve dress shirt in my instance. Uh, because if I need to throw a jacket on, it would work better than like, I actually leave a jacket, like a sports coat at the office in case I have a meeting and leave a tie. I used to do this in my other job too. And I leave a tie in the desk drawer. Cause you never know. Like if you have to, <laughs> if all of a sudden the, an upgraded meeting is there, uh, I live really close to my office. So it's not a big deal unless I walk, uh, which I have done a couple of days. It's a 40 minute walk to the office. So in those instances, I couldn't just run back. Well, I guess I could, but it would, <laughs> I need, I need a, I need a bigger window. But yes, so long story short, Tony, I, I could justify wearing more dress watches, but 
I'm still just let me get through 2023 without buying a dress watch, another dress watch. One was enough. Let's just let me just let me have this one thing. In 2024, we can have a new New Year's resolution. I don't do New Year's resolutions, but we can use that as the underpinning of the argument that now I'm allowed to get dress watches again. But for now, no, no, no more in 2023. Neff is going to pick Beauvais here. Let's take a look at that. Um, uh, I love Laurent Ferrier, but not, uh, but I don't like that case. Okay. Yeah. I actually kind of like the case. Um, Koji likes all these watches. Let's go ahead and take a look at the Beauvais really, really quick. Um, wow, that is a lot of intricate work. This has got to be over 200,000, right? 300,000. Okay. <laughs> I'm still not fully used to like what, like, what was it? Or whatever they, I have no French pronunciations. Um, <laughs> uh, high horology. These like intricate brand things and what they do, I is, it's very interesting, but I still underestimate just how much they can command for Debethune does this on some watches too. 12 o'clock uh, crown. I do actually like the 12 o'clock crowns. I don't like the strap configuration that accommodates it though. So it's been a struggle for me. But hey, I mean, if you really if you like the elegant ones, seven millimeters, that is thin for a tourbillon. Very thin. So yeah, I can see it. And I'm sure they've got a whole paragraph here on how much hand finishing they do. But I think it's kind of obvious with the way this looks. I do like, this reminds me of, I really like individual bridges for gear trains. That's probably from my pandemic days, though, when I would work on, I'd get broken watches on eBay and I'd try and fix them, which I like successfully fixed like two. I successfully disassembled like 15. Um, and I wished lining up the bridges on the gears was so frustrating. I thought if these all had individual bridges, Life would be so much easier, but I never, uh, there was never a cheap one for me to go ahead and, and, uh, be able to do that. Uh, so let's see. DeRosa says, I'm sort of surprised, uh, that FP, uh, didn't put the Turbion only visible, uh, from the back, more of their style. Oh, huh. yeah. I don't know. Cloud, uh, Ken says, uh, Laurent Ferrier can barely see the Torb. I like the Bulgari. Uh, looks like an Urverk. Uh, we didn't look at that one closely. That very good comparison, though, Ken. I definitely do get, now that you've pointed it out, I definitely do get Urverk vibes from this. Again, this is very avant garde. Uh, and if you're normally, I'm not keen on avant garde, as I've noted earlier in this, in this live stream. But it, when it comes to Turbion, because I think the Turbion is a worthless complication in a dress watch, I think you might as well have fun with it. So I just don't, I don't know. This is weird. It's very sporty um for for such a i don't know yeah i definitely get the vibe i don't i don't hate it but i don't love it uh like i'd rather like this uh hyt just unwearable madness under the dial like if we're going to do a tourbillon i might let's just have the infinity gauntlet Than thanos could wear it so so that makes it okay all uh, right, let's see. What else? Koji says, Arnold's son looks like a Jacquette Droz, petite seconds with it. Yes, Jacquette Droz, very much a, a, an apt comparison uh, for the dial look. Uh, let's see. <laughs> yes, this is it regarding the HYT, 25 millimeter thickness. Uh, Koji saying it slides under any cuff. Well, French cuffs, when we'll leak French cuffs, we'll admit that. Respectably late. Good day from Sydney. Welcome, respectably late. You're not late. You're uh, like a hobbit or a wizard. A wizard. You arrive exactly when you meant to. Uh, welcome to the live stream. As well as Mike. Mr. Mike Hamilton says, no, buy a dress watch dance in all caps. Well, we don't need the screaming of the all caps. Absolutely not. I am holding strong. I am most way through this year. I am not buying another dress watch in 2023. You've heard it here first. I hope I don't have to break it. I'm going to try really hard. I'm going to be strong. Tony says January 1st, 2024 buys three new dress watches. Absolutely not. I'm going to that. I have to recover from Christmas spending. There's got to be, look, I have, there's like a, there's a recovery period to life. And, and some of that kicks in in January. Uh, Mike says, I like the HYT probably can't read it, but no big deal. As when I look at my watch, I'm not looking to determine the time. I'm pretty big normally on time telling with the watches. So I would be judgmental of that, but if we're going for a tourbillon, we're already admitting we're just buying something that's just ridiculous. Okay. Calendar and astronomy. I'm starting to get the vibe that Parmigiani paid someone to have a watch in every category because they seem to. Uh, but here we go. Beauvais, 1822. Uh, so Beauvais appears again. Uh, IWC's here again, but not with the Igenur this time. 
Uh, they are doing their uh, big pilots watch perpetual calendar Top Gun Lake Tahoe. I've talked about that watch before. I think we played it uh, played it in a this or that versus another watch. Uh, Philippe uh, Picolit, don't know this brand. Moon Phase One, that's a very simple name compared to IWC's naming. Messina Lab, first appearance. Uh, we skipped over the ladies' watches, so I don't know if they had one there. Probably not, though. The the Hobbering Squared uh, Messina Lab collaboration, the Chrono Felix Perpetual. I had heard about this watch. I never looked into it, though. Uh, Parmigiani's Tonda PF Zali Chinese Calendar. Interesting. Um, I had never I'd never seen this one before reviewing this for today's video. And Piaget has a polo yet again, not their green one we looked at earlier. This is the Perpetual Calendar Obsidian. Okay, so... I'm not a big uh, calendar watch person. Um, my favorites are probably everything, all four of these, like not the Beauvais, not the Philippe, though that's probably got like the best finishing of all of them all or something. But the IWC, it's got that similar uh, moon phase, phase approach, kind of reminds me of what Parmigiani likes to do, which we've discussed before. But I think it's really cool that it's got the Chinese calendar. Um, the Messina Lab one looks pretty clean, so I'm okay with that. And, of course, uh, Piaget polos always look good, so this is no exception there. So um, let's go ahead and I'll open those four up because we do what I like first, and then we do what the chat likes if it's anything else that I didn't cover because it's my stream. All right, so there's IWC. I, I know we've talked about this watch before in one of the games uh, that we played, so... This is it. A very, uh, you know, very sports watch style approach. You've got the, you got the power reserve here. You've got the, the day of the month, the calendar date here. You've got the day of the week over here, running seconds in the center over here at the nine. And then you've got what month it is here. The year is clearly spelled out entirely over here at the 730 position. And then we've got our little moon face complication and time in the center. Um, I don't know about a little north south with a little airplanes, but hey, it's the Top Gun Lake Tahoe, so it's gonna have its little jets. Gotta have its little jets there. So if you're into IWC pilot watches, this is probably the one for you. Wouldn't be a watch I would buy, but I, I think it looks clean. It's, it's nice. It wouldn't shock me if it won. So here's the Hobbering Squared uh, collaboration watch. I just liked it because, hey, they didn't crop any of the Arabic hour numerals. And you know I hate how they crop those numerals from time to time on these sort of watches. Uh, so super clean. I actually prefer this uh, aesthetically. Uh, to I like the leap year indicator here with a one, two, three, four. Uh, so we've got month of the year at the 6 o'clock subdial. We got day of the week, 3 o'clock subdial. We got date, 9 o'clock subdial. And then we've got the running seconds. I'm assuming is that what that is up here at the top? Plus the moon face. Actually, yeah, I really like this a lot um, as a watch look. I I need to figure out exactly what the is this a oh it's a chronograph, so it's a mono pusher chronograph, right? Okay, so it's also got chronograph uh, timekeeping. I don't know if I I'd probably actually prefer this if it was a little less complicated and didn't have the chronograph functionality, but. But it's attractive. What's the price on this? 23,000 Swiss francs. Okay, lower than I thought. The Messina Lab collabs range a lot. They've had inexpensive ones, like, you know, sub 5,000, and they've had higher. I did own a collab watch. I had one of their Ming, the Ming, the one with all the issues. I had one of those. Very aesthetically nice. But even wearing my watch, I try and, you know, keep the watch up, up at the wrist bone. But that one, if I'd reach into my pocket, the crown would gouge me. So I knew uh, none of the Mings worked for me. So anyway, uh, moving along. Here's the here's the Tonda. Um, I don't know Chinese. I, I can't read Chinese, much less speak it. Um, actually, I should say I can't speak Chinese, much less read it, because reading it would probably be harder to learn uh, for someone who didn't study it as a child. But aesthetically, nice little patterning. I love the Parmigiani dial look, though. Uh, and I like their moon and they've done this moon face configuration for a while. A lot of times it's up toward on their other watches. They're less complicated watches. They'll put it up towards the uh, 12 o'clock instead of the six. So I can't tell you what any of these indicators mean because I don't know anything about it. If you wonder what Parmigiani without the micro rotor looks like, this is their general approach that they do with the full rotor. So again, very attractive watch and polo. I don't really like gym sets in the bezels. So that would that like from an ownership standpoint, that aside, I like everything about the watch. Actually, it looks good this way. I just wouldn't wear it. Um, 
I just don't like stones and watches like that. But 110,000 Swiss francs roughly on that watch. What is the Tonda? 60,000. Okay. Okay. Put it back on that. All right. So chat, what is going on with you all? What do you all think? Um, let's see. Neff says, oh, talking back to the uh, chill part 1860. You couldn't buy an 1860 in 2023 anyway. 2024, though, is looking real good. <laughs> I so want to say, I so wish I was important Neff so I could then have just said, do you know who I am? I could get an 1860 if I want an 1860. But you're absolutely right. I could not get one anyway. I don't know if they do wait lists or what. I, I, I'd rather, I don't want to look into it. I don't want to know. Look, I don't need to spend that much money right now. So let's, let's move along. Um, let's see. Tony says someone on the selection committee works for Parmigiani or used to, there's been some discussion about uh, how brands get on this list. So uh, I don't know the details about it. I haven't heard enough of an in-depth dive or read enough of an in-depth dive to be able to do an analysis for you, but I won't say shenanigans, but Hey, yeah. Parmigiani showing up this many times suggests that something's going on or, there's someone like me who just likes everything that they do with their dials and throws them all in the list. But when you think about all of these are like, there were more submitted than this. These are just the final six. So them getting through to the final six, uh, I think is noteworthy. Neff uh, are interesting and could suggest shenanigans perhaps. Uh, Neff saying the Hobbering uh, looks nice. I agree. It does. Uh, Mike says he likes the Philippe. So we will take a look at that because that's not one that I pulled up. And um Neff says, that's not a white ceramic case with a giant steel crown, is it? On the on the Lake Tahoe? Uh, probably. Yeah, it is, a, it is a ceramic, it is a ceramic uh case. I don't know if they're gonna tell us what the crown is made out of. Most of the time the crowns are made out of steel. But but for example, I didn't realize it initially, but like the the Moser I got, even though it's a steel Moser PVD coated, I guess on the I think it's true for all of the uh, pioneers, but the crowns are titanium. Uh, but so, yes. Look, it is awfully, it, but it shined like a gem. Look at it gleam like a diamond. It looks like a big old diamond on it. But hey, you know, IWC and the big crowns, that's what they're known for. So, uh, yeah, no, this, Tony would probably love this because this has got that uh, frosted dial look. Uh, this is the watch that Mike really liked, the Philippe Moon Phase. Um, pretty simple. Weird, to me, weird decision to open work the uh, going train there. Here's the uh, back of it. And you see, oh, look at the moon. You can see. I do like how they did the moon here. That's my That's my favorite part. Uh, I, I like moon phases that get a little creative with how the uh, how the moon is showing, wh whether it's a new moon or full moon. So that that part I like. The rest of this doesn't really work for me, but um, but hey, that's just me. I'm zooming back out. Okay. All right. Mechanical exception. And they actually define all these somewhere, but who cares, right? Who cares? We're 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 moving along. So AP code 1159, but not, but not the star one, not the star wheel we talked about earlier. This is the ultra complication universal RD number four, very specific. Uh, Chop Heck, first appearance of Chop Heck on this uh, list. Again, we're not, we didn't go over the ladies watches. Maybe they're in there. I didn't look. Um, hot Lentz. I think I've heard of Hot Lentz. Uh Jacob and Co. Definitely heard of Jacob and Co. Astronomica Revolution. I've never looked at that watch before. Louis Vuitton, uh, Tambor Opera Automatica, and Rudy Silva RS thirty feet three. Okay, so mechanical exception definition for those aren't familiar are watches that are not attractive. Okay, dramatic pause over. I'm just kidding. I just think they're all ugly. Uh, the code 1159 is my favorite. Like if I was to wear one, this is the closest we would get would be that probably followed by this Ruta Silva. Um, if I'm going to give kudos to just one looking wacky, I'm going to do the Louis Vuitton because, Hey, they did an opera mask. It's weird. It's creepy. Um, if you have small children, it will induce nightmares. 
Uh, but it's got the little fan thing going on here, which I think half of the people are going to look at and go, that's not a fan, that's half of a roulette wheel. But whatever. I don't know. Let's see. So Mike says, I didn't know wrestlers though, so it could be a one-off. He's asking if it's the Undertaker watch. No, it's an opera watch, supposedly. Tony thinks the hot lens is interesting, so we'll load that one up. I would never wear this. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. They're all interesting. Like mechanically, they're all interesting. Um, not the thickest thing in the world. I thought this would be more like 20. It's it's 15.6 millimeters. Uh, sizable mechanical winding watch, 66,000 Swiss francs. Uh, this stuff just doesn't work for me. But, but hey, there's a certain type that likes this sort of stuff. Neff says, the exceptions are the people that buy these. The Rudis and Chapek are okay, I guess. Um, yeah, the, I don't know. I don't understand what's going on with the Chapek. It's, it's just, it just seems like it's really open worked. Um, it's got some retrograde thing going on here. I guess the retrograde, what, hour? No, minute? I mean, minute, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. I don't like it. I don't like it. I can't get excited about it. Uh, this one seems a little cleaner, so I like it a bit more. It's, I, I don't know. I don't like, I don't know means I don't like it. They didn't even give a picture of the back. It's just two pictures of the front. Whatever. None of these I think are interesting enough to talk about. Koji says the Chinese opera watch is visually striking for sure. I mean, yeah, but like Jacob and co, it just it feels like they just threw a lot of weird stuff under the glass and called it a thing. And I just, I mean, I'm sure mechanically it's really like this dragon thing wrapping around is, is pretty slick and look at the dragon face. I mean, it's as like a fashion piece, I'm sure. I just, I, I don't look at me. I'm sitting here with my first Sona t-shirt that you can buy at this convenient link that I will now share again in the chat for my, for my click to gamers podcast. Like that's the stuff. I, I don't have fashion sense. I'm not a fashion person. Like I wear like really cheap clubs. I, I just like watches. This stuff just doesn't, it's just not for me. So I can't comment with any degree of, of intelligence on these. I'm just far too ignorant of like, I can see the craftsmanship. It's like, I can look at the AP black Panther watch. Like if you remember those, I, I can look at that and I can understand like the craftsmanship. I can understand how many hours it would take to carve that black Panther out of white gold. But to me, it's still an action figure on a watch. Like, I just don't have the, I just don't have the brain for it. It just doesn't, like, this is not for me. It's for cool people. I'm not, I'm not one of the cool kids. So what I understand are chronographs, though. I do understand chronographs. So here are the six nominees for the chronographs. No Parmigiani. We got two in a row without Parmigiani. Uh, so that's good. We got APs or Oil Oak Offshore Self-Winding Flying Tourbillon Chronograph. Um, Debathoon, the DB8. I'm familiar with the DB8. I actually like the DB8. The DB8 is my favorite on this list. Grand Seiko's Telegraph, though, is on this list. Uh, as is Peterman uh, Bedat. That's a chronograph for Rattraponte. I'm not familiar with it. A little too skeletonized and hard to read the dial uh, hour markers for me. Uh, the Singer Reimagined, actually, I think is a pretty cool looking watch. Um, but it's got that, what is that? Uh, so Tonos, is that the Tonos case shape? Some people, that's going to be polarizing for folks. Uh, but I like the, I like it. Um, and Tag Heuer, uh, the Skipper. Skipper got a ton of attention uh, from Watch Media. A lot of people, because that's a revival. So um, I, like my favorite is the Debathoon. Like, like aesthetically dial wise, my favorite is the Debathoon. As a chronograph, this is the singer reimagined. Um, and I think the tag is actually what ends up winning this thing. So we'll load all three of them so we can take a look. So here's the DB8. If you're not familiar with it, was this? This is the titanium one. Again, we already talked about a different titanium watch of theirs earlier. This one does not Star Trek it up on the back. So if you're not into the Star Trek thing, I love Star Trek. I watched Moopsie on Lower Decks. I know all about the Moopsie, but the... Um, this is the style for a watch that I actually like. So I like this quite a bit, but it's Debethune. It's 92,000 Swiss francs. It's super expensive. You can get other really nice Gia shade engine turn dials. Uh, I just like what they're doing like this more than what I see out of Breguet. 
Uh, the skipper, a lot of people really got excited about this. Very approachable, six six hundred Swiss francs. Uh, I'm sure you'll be able to find these gray and used, uh, going for less as time goes by. This, uh, but overall, I, you know, I, I think it it resonates pretty well. It's the regatta color scheme that they do that's going to appeal to people. So it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun. I like the pushers on it. And yeah, what they did down with the, the small seconds on the date, I don't love, so it's not my pick, but like I'm not in the market for this watch at all. But I do think it ends up winning. I think it that's just I just think it appeals to a lot of people. The vintage that vintage stuff always really, really resonates. Now, how much is this? Dang. I I was thinking, is this around the price of the tag? I could see looking into this, but no, at 55,000 Swiss francs, this is not a dentist watch, but this is cool. I just like the plungers being on both sides and their balance. And they, they've turtle, like almost turtle cased this and, and, and crowned it like how Seiko would. It says Singer. So everyone's going to think that it's made by the sewing machine company. So that's going to throw people for, for a loop. No one's going to be like, wow, I didn't know Singer went into watches and sewing machines. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So I don't know. Uh, just aesthetically, it's really weird, but in a way that works for me. It's avant. It's not so much avant-garde as it is as like this blend of, I don't know. Let's say neoclassical designs with all this stuff with the, the pointers and everything uh, going on here at the bottom. I just think it's weird enough that I actually like this one. So this would be my favorite, but I don't think it wins. I think the tag wins. Uh, so that is my pick. From earlier, uh, Mike had mentioned Piaget all the way for him. Uh, Ken chooses the Grand Seiko. Now, this could be the one that ends up getting the support. Uh, I'm too much in the vein. Like, I like Grand Seiko more in their heritage line, but this also got a lot of attention from watch media when it came out. Um, I don't think GPHG, G, excuse me, GPHG kills this just because it's a 430 date window. Though, of course, people didn't like that. But hey, Grand Seiko got a Grand Seiko, and they always got to do one design thing that no one likes. It's usually the bracelet, or it's putting the power reserve indicator in a place that you don't like, or it's putting a giant emblem on their on their sapphire display crease back so you can't even appreciate the movement because it got a big old lion on it. There's always something they do wrong. So maybe that's what they do wrong. Again, I'm okay with it. I think it looks good. I agree. It's a. I just don't think it. Uh, for me, it's the hour hand. I can't, I don't like these giant hour marker, uh, hour hands. I should have not the hour marker, the hour hands that they do on the, on their sport versions of their watches. I love the uh, heritage style that they do. So for me, very sporty, it's too industrial, uh, to resonate with me in this configuration. Uh, but it does scream sports watch. And I know a lot of fans of this. So Ken might, uh, Ken picking this, this might actually be the one that wins. I think I, I didn't give it a fair enough shake. Uh, out of the out of the set of six in terms of what might win GPHG, but um, I'll stick with my tag uh, pick, um, even though I could very well be wrong at this point. As I think about it more and more, I'm probably am wrong. Neff doesn't like any of these. I like the angiograph movement in it. I'm assuming that's what it's using, uh, and yeah, I assume that's yeah. You meant the singer because I don't I don't know the movement otherwise, and everything else I think has a has a pretty well known movement. Tony says singer has jumping minutes and jumping hour. That is great. Yeah, jump, jumps are fun. I like and I like uh, retrogrades as well. Um, but in, you know, it's unusual to see that in the chronograph space. So there's that. And I think the last one we will do because other than that, I think we just got jewelry and artistic crafts, which again is more art, art stuff, like little. I thought I thought this was like a Little Mermaid basking in the sun, but it's a lion and a tiger. So whatever. And okay, no, we got a couple others. Okay, I was trying to. I I thought we were at the. We're gonna do. Don't worry, we're running long. It's fine. Whatever. It's only my time. People jumping in and out as they need to. Sports watches. This is the one that a lot of you are gonna have opinions on, and I do not know. Here are your choices: Chopard, Alpine Eagle, Cadence Eight HF, the Doxa Army Watch, the Gronfeld's 1969 Delta Works, uh, the Eigener has showed back up again. Uh, this is the automatic 40 though, um, tags, uh, Monza flyback chron chronometer and the Tudor Pelagos 39. I, okay. Surely not this doxer, right? This thing is really ugly. So we're going to say no to the doxa. I like Grunfeld. <clears throat> so aesthetically, I like this dial, but here's the thing. Other than the tag Hoyer, I like all these dials. 
So even the Doxa dial, this is weird. I just don't like that this this camo weird color scheme thing. I don't know what Doxa was thinking when they did this watch. The Chopard is just again, it's not the like I would think more of the salmon dial Alpine Eagle, but clearly this one is very sporty given the orange uh, highlights, the orange second hand. So I get that, and I do like the uh, the Alpine Eagle look that they do with these dials with the eagle eye sort of look. So I think that's a really, and I also think Chopard stands out well enough with its design language that it, when you look at it, you might initially see the screws and think Royal Oak, or you might see the case shape and think Nautilus. But honestly, when I see them, it look because of the blending of it, I never immediately get a vibe of either of those. So I think it's pretty distinct. So I like that a lot too. Um, of course the Pelagos 39. Yes, it's, highly derivative. Uh, it's just a smaller version of the Pelagos. So in that regard, I'm kind of annoyed that it's even in this, but it's a, it's an attractive watch. I'm going to say no on it. Just for the same reason with what I whined about with the FXD video I did earlier. And when we talked about the new black dial FXD, it's way too many lines of text. We don't need that much text on the watch that disqualifies it automatically there. I've made the decision Tudor gets dropped, but, um, but dial configuration wise, it's like the purest sports watch out of, and that's my problem with the Gronfeld. This doesn't look like a sports watch to me. Yeah, I think they threw it on a leather, a leather strap or rubber strap, excuse me. I like the way I like the way it looks with the frosted dial, but I don't. You know what? I mean, I think the Tudor wins. That's I think the Tudor wins, but like if I were. If we're buying one of these, I'd probably buy the Tudor. I don't know. Maybe the Gronfeld. But I wouldn't be buying it as a sports watch. I like the Alpine Eagle, but not this configuration. I and the Igenur, I don't like this. I don't like the one with the date. I don't know. That's I don't. I don't know. I don't feel strongly. What do you guys think? You guys think Koji says Gronfeld, thumbs up. Neff says Doxa likes the Gronfeld, but it's big, expensive, and impossible to get. Okay. I like Doxa, but I don't like that color scheme. Ken says, can I pick Tudor because it's the closest to a Rolex? Yes, you can. I mean, as far as sports watches go, it's like the sports watchiest sports watch of these sports watches. So I think that's, that's fair. Uh, Mike says, blah, Tudor. Yeah, but I mean, Tudor, it's just, I mean, as a like pure sports watch, they even got a date on it, which is like part of the thing I don't like about the, the Igenur is the three o'clock date here with its, I don't know. I almost think it'd be better with a Cyclops, but yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, carbon case rules out the tag for me. I, I don't like the, I don't trust carbon cases. So yeah, I don't know. All right. Everyone's all over the place on that. We're going to skip jewelry. We're going to skip artistic crafts. So petite, uh, Ag- Agile is like affordable watches. I think is that they're, they're all below a certain price point. So Bulgari's Octo Roma automatic uh, affordable is used loosely. We're not talking under a thousand dollars. The Bel Canto, Christopher Ward, the Hobbering two, um, it's, uh, or Hobbering squared. I don't know how we say the name of that company. The Chrono Felix top second, uh, Louis Erard's uh, Constantine Ch- Chakin watch. Very weird. Messina labs, uh, Raul Paget uh, collaboration and the Tudor black Bay. I think the Belcanto wins this. I do not like the look of the Belcanto, so it's definitely not my pick, but I do think it's what wins. Of these, the Tudor Black Bay is easily my favorite pick. Um, though I do like I like the sector dial cleanness of the Messina Lab, but this is almost a little too stark. Like, what's this dot? Why is there this dot going up to this? I, I got it. It got a little too cute. Like, I'd rather look at the back of it. I don't know. It's fine. It's clean. And, and, you know, it's okay. I wouldn't buy it. Well, yeah, I affordable. Maybe I maybe I meant something else than what I said. But I think I saw the Bel Canto and assumed this was the affordable series. But seventy eight hundred uh, Swiss francs. Uh, no. Whereas you can get this for under 4,000. You know, this is the one with a red bezel. I think it looks really good. Uh, yeah, it's basic, but hey, um, it's nice. I love gilt. So gilt, uh, gilt on black dial. I love that. Uh, that's what my, my black bay bronze had. This would be far more wearable or slightly more wearable. 
So there's that. This is cute. This is fun. I, you know, it's too wacky for me unless it's really cheap. And I don't think the Constantine Chaikin watches are. I think they're, uh, they're not bad. They're not as bad as what, whether the other one that does the clown faces, the ones that get really expensive. But here, 4,300. This actually, I mean, if you've got the money for a wacky watch, this is kind of fun with its weird old little monster. It's going to look like a little monster. So, yeah. Uh, I, I wouldn't get it this high. Like, I'd need this to be like 400 Swiss francs, not 4,300 Swiss francs. But if you're into this, it's weird. So, uh, that might actually compete. This might actually take out the Bel Canto. The Bel Canto, I... I like the sunburst, but again, I've already whined about it. So little of the dial is dedicated to time telling. The rest of it is to highlight this chiming feature that Meistersinger already used. So I just, I know people hear that it chimes and they feel like they're getting a fancy complication. Um, it's 3,400 Swiss francs. So it's not a cheap, I mean, it's inexpensive for a, a sound, mechanical sound watch, but it's not a fancy sound system thing. I I, to me, I, I know people love it. It just doesn't work for me. But, but so yeah, I think I'm going to say, yeah, I think the Bel Canto wins. This may be second place. My pick out of these six is the Black Ray, though. Um, Mike thinks G Shock wins this one. Well, you're wrong, Mike, because G Shock isn't a choice. And that Louis has a giant <laughs> butthole on it. It's the monster hole. It's the monster hole. Oh, the challenge might be the affordables. There we go. I knew they had an affordable category because then there's just clocks after that. We're not going to look at the clock. All right. Uh, Corona Tokyo, their GMT-1. Nomos Glashuta, Cam Club Campus. The Raymond Vale, Millisimi. Seiko's uh, 1968 Modern Reinterpretation. Studio Underdog Watermelon. And the Timeless Swiss Watch. <sighs> Of all of these, Studio Underdog's water. I know everyone likes the likes the watermelon, but I can't help it. I do too. Because it looks like a watermelon. This is sort of fun. And it's about a thousand bucks. So this was a limited set. They do other they do other things. Um, but I don't know. I like it. It's neat. Uh, Mike says, didn't a kid decide that design that underdog? I want to say she did for some content. I have no idea, but I think it works. Uh, it's goofy and fun. It'd be better if it was a little bit less price wise. I think more people would be able to get into it. Um, Neff says, Nomus, just a good solid watch. I know a lot of people love, love Nomus. I do not, I do not like the aesthetic design. I hate California dial, so I would never pick this, but it is a very fun watch. Uh, and um, it's, it's approachable 1500 Swiss francs. A lot of people, uh, seem to get these like as college graduation presents and stuff. And I could see why it's very modern looking. I think if I were 20 years younger, I might, you know, I could see maybe trying to pull it off. I just don't, for me, it just doesn't work with, with me, but, um, but that's true for all the Nomos line. If I were to go with the Nomos and their Baja style, I like the club line because I think they're more fun. And the color scheme is the most interesting part of that watch to me. Not really into the, the Raymond Vial here. Uh, the Seiko, a lot of people love the Seiko. Um, I think the Studio Underdog wins this one, though. Um, I just think it's just it's fun enough that that's why. I think it, it pulls ahead. But anyway, so that's GPHG. There's lots of other things. There are also other categories we didn't cover. I've already been going for 90 minutes, which is probably way too long for most of you. Um, Tony mentioned, uh, incidentally, liking the GMT-1 uh, from Corona Tokyo. Uh, my only reason why I didn't name that one is the date window, I think, sticks out like a sore thumb on this watch. Uh, other than that, I like the very modern design choices that they went with. Uh, so, like, I like this uh, streaking, these lines that they've gouged through the 18 to 6, so you can easily tell the night indicator um, for the GMT. But and it makes sense that the GMT would have a date. I just don't like the way it 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 cuts through this interior uh 24 hour marking and it's framed, but I just I just don't like the choice that they did here. It's 2000 Swiss francs. So for I like so much about it, but that like I like the handset, I like it need and I do think it needs the date, but honestly, they probably should have sacrificed the six and stuck it down there and just done done it the way they did. 
or stuck it above the six here at GMT. I don't know how small you'd have to get pulling it in that close and then color matching it against the black where it'd be easier to blend. So those are my thoughts on that. But um, that's why I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't rally behind it. Neff said, I wonder if Corona used the Miyoto 9075 for that. Uh, I'm looking in at the write up right now to see if they've noted on the, on this site, if they declared what the movement was, they don't have a movement shop and they don't say, so I don't know. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and end it this, uh, week as a reminder, uh, I do have a video I put out uh, just a few hours ago with my first thoughts as a summary about the new Pelagos FXD black dial. So if you don't want to go back and watch the beginning of this live stream, you can do that. Uh, if you're interested in the weird shirt uh, that Tony and I have for Eclectic Gamers Pocket, I'm starting to sweat through it clearly, um, that his daughter did. That's him as the walrus. That's me. And that she strapped a little watch to me. So it's got a time theme to it. I've got a link in the chat. For those that want to want to buy shirts, uh, they're there because they're not part of my shirt. I do have a shirt merch thing. I don't have it active. Like it's active on the site. It's not active on YouTube because all I are are designs with my logo, which I don't, I'm not popular enough for merch. I just did them for fun because I already had the logo design. But anyway, uh, Discord link in the chat. Join the Discord if you haven't. It's a uh, we chat like textually chat. It's like a portable chat room for your phone. You can use it on PC. It's really really good. Uh, Tony does confirm that it is the Miyota 9075 in the Corona Tokyo GMT-1. Uh, so that is the answer to that, Neff. And also, if you want to join the 99 Cent Club, it's in the video description. I'm not posting it in the chat. There's no point. Uh, it's it's hard to recruit people who want to pay money. So that's just there if you want to do that. That's it. I'll plan to be back next uh, weekend with another live stream. No idea what the topic will be. Maybe we'll have another weird colorway announcement from another brand that will make a big deal out of the molehill. We will find out then. Take care, everybody. Have a great weekend.